Well, I again want to thank everyone for their service on the commission. I also want to thank the judicial branch staff here today that made things happen. As you may have seen, I brought an honored guest with me this morning. My son James is here in support of me today. And as many of you know from our earlier conversations prior to this morning, he just graduated from high school this past weekend. So James is our oldest. So over these past weeks and months, my husband and I have had a number of emotions and reflections as he prepares to leave our nest. He'll be heading off next week, actually. He took a summer job out of state. And so part of that reflection for me has been thinking about how my approach to parenting has changed over time and the practicalities of parenting <laughs> affecting that parenting philosophy, as it were. So all the things you say as a parent that you'd never do or that you'd always do uh, become a lot harder when you haven't slept for days with a newborn or your high schoolers are facing challenges you never even anticipated when they were babies. <clears throat> and so I've been in this reflective mindset these past couple weeks and months and that culminated with this process also happening at the same time. So I guess that really got me thinking and really reflexively thinking about my judicial philosophy. And part of that was due to the fact <laughs> a number of you asked me, what is your judicial philosophy? And I think I answered that question in a way you wouldn't expect. To me, the underlying ideas and beliefs that drive my work as a judge are far more practical than theoretical. I believe you do the work, you do your level best to get it right, and you follow the law, whether you want to, <laughs> and even when you don't really want to, and even when no one would probably notice if you didn't. Because I think what I've learned in being a parent and a judge and just living my life, that your philosophy ends up getting defined by your acts and not just your stated beliefs. I believe my record shows that I do the work. So in our judicial subdistrict, we have 11 district court judges. And in 2023, I had the highest percentage of cases disposed of. In my judicial performance review, my highest rating was for the promptness of my rulings and decisions. And just even in this most recent five-week session that we just finished up, I had two civil jury trials, two bench trials, and numerous hearings which included everything from criminal pleas and sentencings to civil motions to dismiss and motions for summary judgment. So as my husband would put it, I move the iron and I do it efficiently. Also too, in order to follow the law as a judge, you obviously need the requisite experience. And I think the way I would define that necessary experience has changed over time. I think if you'd asked me in law school, I would have told you that only folks at the top of the class or editors of the law review were fit to be future judges. And that certainly did not include me. And then I graduated from law school and I became an attorney. And I quickly realized <laughs> that you can be the top of your class, you can be the editor of the law review, you can pass the bar, and you can still not have the first clue as to how to actually practice law. And fortunately for me, I began my career learning from and working with excellent federal trial judges. And those attorney, excuse me, trial attorneys, and those attorneys also taught me the importance of mentorship. And what I learned in that first job has stuck with me, not only those skills and just how to be a lawyer, but that mentorship piece has stayed with me as well. And I think my experience in federal court and starting in federal court then gave me the confidence and the skills to then practice in other areas of the law that I never would have even considered. And also then led me to open my own solo practice and eventually led me to the bench. All of this experience taken together, I think, has taught me how to actually practice law and not just understand the law. And while I don't personally believe that prior judicial experience is necessary to serve on an appellate court, to me, it's been invaluable. I think the best preparation you can have to serve as an appellate court judge is learning how, as a trial court judge, to write a ruling that not only accurately applies the law to the facts, but also through your writing, you manage to tell somebody they were wrong, or at the very least, you're telling someone you don't agree with them, and you manage to do it in a way that lets them know they were heard 
and that they were afforded a fair shake. I also think your choice of words and what you choose to include or not include in a ruling is also a reflection of your judicial de demeanor. And I believe when you look at my rulings and my work, you'll see that I strive to follow my judicial philosophy in that regard every day. I also think too that my life experience and that varied life experience I've had impacts my ability to carry out my judicial philosophy. As a judge, I always instruct juries that you don't check your common sense and life experience at the courtroom door. In fact, that's what makes the system of justice work and what citizens bring to it through their participation. And to me, judges are no different. There's a practical component to every ruling that I write. And that practicality and common sense partially comes from having lived a kind of interesting life up to this point. I didn't follow a straight path. I was raised by people that taught me and my brother that taking those bold swerves is often scary, but ultimately rewarding. And that led me to leaving the law and eventually coming back. And I also bring just my general life experience in the experiences I've had in, with my family and as a wife and a mother. And all of that brings me the ability to have that practicality and common sense in the work that I do. And I would bring that life experience and that common sense and that practicality to my work on the Court of Appeals. I know all of you have heard from a number of people that have contacted you in support of my candidacy for this position. I am deeply humbled by their support. One of the hardest things for me in this process is having to talk incessantly about myself, um, but probably equally as difficult is knowing that others are putting the time and effort in to supporting me as well. I am rather notorious for not accepting help very well. And that's something I need to work on. But I would ask you to take those remarks into consideration, and especially those you received from folks that have worked with me and appeared in front of me, in considering whether I would be a good fit for the Court of Appeals. I am far from a perfect parent or a perfect judge. And while my husband and I would like to take full credit for the two amazing humans we've raised together, we know that that's not all due to us. But what I can take full credit for, and honestly full responsibility for, is my record as an attorney and as a judicial officer. And I think my actions and my work product would probably prove to you better than anything I could tell you here this morning that my philosophy, my record, and my demeanor well, you'll be able to find that I'm deserving of your nomination for a position on the Court of Appeals when you take all of that into consideration. I'd be honored to receive it, and I'll open it up to any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll start with Commissioner Picklett. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Judge, thanks for your application. Um, you have great experience. I think early on, federal <coughs> public defender, um, and then private practice, and then work as a magistrate now, on the district court, in your application, you define this as the next step in your career. Can you tell us why? And I want to make it clear, too, that I don't view this as ascending the ladder, per se. I view this position as an opportunity to become a specialist, as it were. So I've had the opportunity now as an attorney, and especially doing appellate work when I was an attorney. That was some of the favorite work that I did. And then as a judicial officer, what I really enjoy is being able to dive into a case, dive into research, and write a ruling. And it's not that I don't enjoy trial work, and I always have, but that's really, to me, I've discovered my real focal interest in the work that I do. So to me, an appellate court position and a position on the Court of Appeals would give me the opportunity to do that type of work full time. So for me, again, this isn't a prestige issue. You know, being a judge is an awesome responsibility and a great job, but it's also not who I am, it's what I do. So I don't pursue this in order to, like I said, you know, climb the next rung of the judicial ladder. I pursue this in order to, like I said, be what I view as somewhat of a specialist as a judicial, judicial <coughs> officer, excuse me. Thank you. Commissioner Stanger. Thank you, Judge Moore. Thank you for your application. Great to have you with us again. So um, over, our couple times of being together, 
we get a lot of letters on the commission and some of them, um, what we've heard really about you are three things. You run a tight and fair courtroom, uh, you're collegial and approachable, and you have one of the most diverse backgrounds among our applicants. I'd like to know if these are rumors or true, <laughs> or if uh, you have any other comments about what we've been told about you. I, I would say those, those ring true for me, certainly. Um, I, I think I try very hard to strike a balance between collegiality with those even that appear in front of me, but also running that tight ship. You know, I believe rules are important. I believe decorum is important, and I try to reflect that in the way I run my courtroom. But at the same time, I also know, you know, it's, it's hard work that we do in this profession, whether you're an attorney or a judge, and there's times where it's just good for everyone involved when you, when you can have a moment and have a conversation with an attorney that's, you know, just collegial and, and personable, and, and I try to be warm and welcoming in that regard. But, you know, when we need to set the tone, we set the tone. And I haven't reviewed everyone the applications that have applied this time for this position, but I, I'd probably make a fair argument. I, I have one of the more diverse, <laughs> diverse roads or paths I've, I've uh, taken in my life. So I, I think that's probably fairly accurate as well. Thank you, Judge. Commissioner Hoig. Thank you, Judge Moore, for your application. Um, so the Court of Appeals is known for their collegiality. How would you add to that team, in a sense, and another part to that if um, you come across a case where maybe you and another judge's um, opinions differ, how would you handle that? No, and I partly pursue, th pursue this position because of that known collegiality, and I have the benefit and the honor of knowing a number of judges that already serve on the court, and a few of them I worked with before they were even on the court. So I know, like I said, a number of people already on there. I think the loss of Chief Bauer is a huge loss to the court. I think, you know, he, I think one of the judges on the court described him as, as our compass. Um, so I think in filling this position, at least for me, one of my considerations as a commissioner would be that collegiality piece and, and who would be a good fit. And I think I've just demonstrated in, Commissioner Stanger brought it up as well. You know, a number of folks have recognized the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm pretty collegial with just about anybody. I obviously work in an area that has a lot of strong personalities, um, so I'm very used to that. Arguably, I've got one myself. So I, but I think, too, at the end of the day, I, I don't, I take my work seriously. I don't know how seriously, necessarily, I take myself. So I am open to other people's positions and arguments, and that would include fellow judges on the Court of Appeals, and quite honestly, disagreements that occur in the course of the practice of law are ones that I never take personally. So I think that that matters too. I have the ability to stand up for my position and also recognize others, but also if we ultimately just cannot agree, then that's, that's not a personal affront to me. Thank you. Commissioner Spees. Well, I don't in intend this to be an intensely personal question. Um, <laughs> but, but here we are. <laughs> you know, all, all of the applicants are here because they have a, 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 a sense of self-confidence. And um, so I want to kind of flip that. How do you deal with doubt in your professional life? <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, <laughs> I will say it's gotten better over the years. I think when I first started, I, I was young, I, I graduated from college early, so I was probably on the younger end. I think I was maybe the second youngest in our law school class. I also looked 12, which didn't really help matters either. Um, but I think when I first started, I kept fully expecting someone to pop up in the courtroom and say, what is she doing here? Um, that never actually happened. Probably a few judges thought that to themselves, but never <laughs> said it out loud. But, but as I've progressed in my career and I've gotten more experience under my belt, those doubts never go away, at least for me. But I think if they do, you've got a problem, honestly. <laughs> you know, if you start believing everything that you, you know, put forth as a judge, that's, that's problematic. Um, and it's, it's not how you want to behave or practice as a judge either. So I think it's just learning how to handle those doubts. And again, it's, it's having the ability to listen to the other side, you know, determine whether there's grounds for agreement here or, or, or whether you need to dissent from your fellow judges. And, but I would say probably the biggest help for me is over time I, I've gotten better with those doubts. Thank you. Commissioner Hartka. 
Thank you. Judge, it's great to see you again. Uh, you've been a small business owner. Can you talk about the transferable skills as being a business owner and how that would help you be an effective appellate judge if you're selected? Sure. And it's a culture I've been steeped in. My dad left a very lucrative position with a big eight accounting firm to chuck it all and start his own business, you know, with two kids and a wife in tow. Um, as an adult now, looking back on that, I realized what a big deal that was. As a kid, I didn't. So I grew up with that. Um, and then my mom obviously went to law school later in life. She ended up being in practice on her own for a period of time as well. So that small business culture I was steeped in and raised in, and then I go off and I marry a guy who's been a small business owner almost entire professional career. So coupled that with during the period in our marriage where I also was, you know, those, <laughs> those can be scary times um, because you know, there, there is no safety net really. And so I think those experience lend to my practicality and common sense, as I talked about, but just the actual, you know, making sure the lights stay on and the rent is paid and everything else, you become very, very efficient because you have to, and especially in raising a family. And so that is always stuck with me of you get done what needs to get done because there's no one else to do it. And although the Court of Appeals is obviously working as a team, there is a lot of, you know, independent expectation of each judge on that court. And I think my work ethic just lends itself very well to that work. Commissioner Samora. So uh, nine months has passed since we talked last uh, as a group. You mentioned that your district court judge experience will help you if, if you get this position. Anything happened during the past nine months as a district court judge that, that you want to highlight that you think would be helpful? <coughs> Well, I know when we last met, I talked about our fledgling at that point mental health court in Story County. That is now a reality. I get to preside over that court. So if you recall, I was part of the group that put that together. I'm very excited to have that opportunity. Um, and I, I'm a big proponent of specialty courts. I don't think that that's, that's a mystery. Also in our judicial subdistrict in January of this year, we implemented a civil case assignment. So that means that when a responsive pleading gets filed in a civil case, then it gets si assigned to a judge at that point. I personally love it. Um, it feeds into my control issues that I probably also need to address, but, but that case is yours then for its life. Um, but it has also created a lot more windshield time because now, before there was kind of this informal west-east divide in 2B, and now all 11 of us call, cover all of the territory. So there's a little more windshield time, but, but I really enjoy the case assignment. And obviously I've had nine more months of um, trials of all kinds and, and hearings and, and just more experience that I can add to my quiver. Thank you. Commissioner Henderson. I have no questions, thank you. Commissioner Roberts. No questions. Commissioner Hansen. Good morning. Good morning. What do you perceive the impact of self-represented litigants? And that's an impact I've <laughs> dealt with for some time now. When I was a magistrate, the vast majority of the people that appeared in front of me were self-represented. And many times I was the only attorney in the room, uh, which becomes very difficult when you're a judicial officer that you can't give anyone legal advice. You can give legal information. And sometimes that line is very difficult. And so I think my experience as a magistrate was excellent preparation now for the rise we see now at the district court level in self-represented litigants. So again, it gets back to just the basics of, you know, certainly making sure those folks feel they were heard and that they were given a fair opportunity, but also learning the ins and outs of what you can and cannot do as a judge in order to provide those people with legal information but not legal advice. And self-represented litigants, I think, is, is only an issue that's going to increase over time. So I think anybody serving as a judge need to, needs to have those skills. Thank you, Judge. And we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Very sorry, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> so we thank you for your application thank you. and wish you all the best. Thank you all. Thank you.